Microphone check, one, two, what is this? It's the five foot seven assassin in the podcast business. I am your host, Rohan Patra, the rap music plug at your service. Here we are again. I'm going to keep it real with you. It's the things you can't undo. The past, the black Rubik's Cube. Payback always inexact, but I'd be squinting over measuring spoons. For most artists, lyrics like this would be universally regarded as their all-time best moments. But for artists like Billy Woods, though, lyrics like this are a dime a dozen. They're literally just verse 2 off of a song called Hangman. The praise being thrown the way of New York-based rapper, label head of Backwood Studios, and one half of the great Arm & Hammer group are plentiful and growing in their fervor with each and every passing day. After a string of releases that involved high-profile names such as Moore Mother and The Alchemist in late 2020, early 2021, Billy Woods rode this surging wave of acclaim surrounding his music and delivered two legacy-defining works back-to-back -back in 2022 that put the finishing touches on what is, in my humble opinion, the greatest five-year run in hip-hop history. From 2018 onward, we got Paraffin, Hiding Places, Terror Management, Shrines, Brass, Haram, Atheops, White Label, and then finally Church. And if that wasn't enough, the Backwood Studios camp has added to the flurry of incredible forward-thinking art during this time period through the emergence of artists like Elucid, Shrapnel, Akai Solo, Sketch 185, and more. Yet here we are in May of 2023, and Billy Woods has done it again. Teaming up with Kenny Siegel for a second time, Woods has released his newest masterpiece, Maps. And he's here today on this show to talk about his experience creating this record, his writing style, and some of the frequent themes found in his work, Arm & Hammer, the legacy of Backwood Studios, and so, so much more. If you're familiar with me and this show, even in the slightest, you know how I feel about Woods. You know I had to make the most of my opportunity speaking with the GOAT. Let's get to it. The Rap Music Plug podcast presented by QLC TV is the remedy to the I don't have anything good to listen to problem. Through in-depth album and song reviews, as well as artist interviews and general rap commentary sprinkled in between on all of what the mainstream and underground rap scenes have to offer, this is your one-stop shop to knowing what to add to your queue, play next, or pop into your record player. Welcome to the show. Billy Woods, how you doing today? I'm good. I'm all right, yeah. You excited by this Maps release? You got the, the big pitchfork rating. That must be exciting. I thought it was really well written, the review itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was... Uh, I, I know, like, a lot of those things, I imagine, from an artist's perspective, like, can be a bit, uh, bit uncomfortable sometimes with the numeric stuff, especially with pitchfork, but I imagine that that's going to be drawing some new eyes because that's like a pretty damn high rating for any any album let alone a rap album on that publication so that's that's, that's really dope yeah i mean it's nice to be uh it's nice to be praised you know what well, artist doesn't want people to say nice things honestly i i all positive things are appreciated and i also as my normal take is to these things uh, it's not a good review is always good and a well written review or something that's enlightening for people who are reading it um, is always nice yeah for sure and yeah people really like your music uh i think that's a pretty obvious statement but i i knew that obviously i love your music a lot of the listeners of this show love your music but prior to today i sent a tweet out asking listeners to just like share why they love your music in like a response right and the reaction was crazy. There were like over 90 responses on like Twitter and Instagram that spoke to, you know, like your unique way of rapping, your ability to like 
strike emotional chords, reveal truth in your rhymes, the historical references, the humor, personability, all that good stuff. And a sample of this glowing response was uh, one I chose was uh, from Dan O, Free Music Empire, also fellow patron of the show. He said this, and I think you'll you'll like it. He said, I grew up with genius distant MCs, but as dense and ferocious as Woods gets, I'm always left face to face with the heart of the song. A mournful, empathic, survivalist heart. The last entry of a combat zone diary entry in every verse. When precious people die, I listen to Woods. And yeah, so I'm like, wow. I And I imagine for you, hearing stuff like this has to affect your your self-image and your confidence to some extent. Like, how do you handle this kind of gaudy acclaim and still manage to stay grounded? Um, it's hmm. an interesting question. I mean, it's not as though I spent my lifetime bathing in it. So, no, I guess the main the main thing is that uh, the challenge remains to, you know, the challenge is always there waiting for you, you know. It doesn't matter how many great books you've written if you decide to sit down in front of the blank page again, you you have to do it now. You know what I mean? It's no different from sports. You, the championships you won last year aren't going to win you the title this year. Mm. So it's nice, you know, but when you go and sit down to work on something new, the challenge is still going to be there on that blank page. Does it feel like daunting coming back to the plate and making that next great album? I think it always, to some extent, depends on the circumstances, specific thing that's happening. You know, sometimes inspiration has driven you to the blank page again, which, of course, in which case you're just thinking about your inspiration and not. And other times um, there's something that you want to undertake and you're trying to figure out how to do it or whatever. The, the circumstances matter a lot, you know? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it has to do with the nature of the exact project you're working on, your collaborators, or what's going on in your life, and different things, what the idea is. It was much harder for me to make Atheops than it was for me to make Church, not because I think one album is better than the other, just one of them. I had a lot of inspiration and a lot of room to maneuver within the concept, and the other one... I knew what I was trying to do and it was, I knew it was complicated and difficult. And I was working with the producer I'd worked with less. Mm, that's true. Yeah. You have to, you have to find the common ground and um, each thing is different, you know, depending what it is. I think it brings with it its own level of challenge or trepidation or fear that you might not, you know, do a good enough job you know there's a difference between somebody could ask you to write a eulogy for a beloved family member or um write uh you know write a story about like uh your favorite season of your favorite basketball team mm. those two things would probably be for me on a different level of challenge you know what i mean in terms of both of them could be difficult, but one of them, you know, carries a lot of weight where you're like, man, I really don't want to mess this up. And what do other people, what are other people expecting and what should I do? And the other one would be like, I'm writing about the 1994 Houston Oilers. It's not really that serious. Yeah, that is true. If somebody doesn't like it, then whatever. But it's equally, and both things could both be important to me. Yeah, I, I feel like each project has its own level of its own inherent challenges and Things that are easy and things that are hard. And and related to this kind of idea of success, you have a you have a particularly interesting line on NYC Tapwater on the new album where you rap uh crabs in a bucket, how the fuck I escaped them claws, survivor's guilt with a side of buyer's remorse. I'm home, but my mind be wandering off. Mm -hmm. And that one got me thinking because grappling with your achievements in contrast with like where you were in the past in your life i feel is something you've ruminated on quite a bit in your music particularly on maps and other tracks like i think of like Puerto rico come to mind as well and and this so this like idea of survivor's guilt seems to extend also past 
just being a rapper who's like like you know uh, achieved some degree of success since i feel this basic idea of managing to survive in a society we all can acknowledge has some like pretty obvious injustices and atrocities that occur i feel it seems to weigh on your mind and comes up quite a bit so could you elaborate on this discomfort that you feel as someone who's managed to attain some success and a, a standard of living when well i think i think um i think there's several levels because i don't on on some level it's not even about some part of that a significant part of that sentiment in that particular song is not about success making music mm -hmm. it's about being alive and free or as free as one might be it's about being still here right and still in the arena and i mean i guess success um in art does factor in there in some ways but um it's just one part of it yeah and that's and that's kind of where i was going with it because it seems like the rapper part and the success is just one yeah exactly one part of it just generally speaking like there are a lot of people that um i loved and people that i hated who are not here now in different ways of saying that. And I recognize sometimes I was smart and sometimes I was lucky. Mm. And then there are other things which I won't ever know the answers to. How do you how do you reconcile these feelings and like manage that, I don't know what you call it, discomfort or just real like acknowledgement of what you're describing right now? I guess I feel like a certain amount of not forgetting where you come from and all the all the things that brought you to where you are i think um an appreciation for things comes about as a result of that because you remember you know whether it's music stuff when it's like you know I've, I've i've played shows where it was a couple people on or nobody mm. you know i've contemplated whether anybody really cared about what I was doing. And I've had records I put out where the CD sat in my house, my apartment for, you know, five years mm. untold. So you have to throw them out, you know? Um, so having those memories, I think it's, it's, it's one thing that somebody who's more successful out the gate, sometimes I think um, it's cool. It's good. I wouldn't want anybody not saying it's better how things went with me, but uh, I do appreciate that part of the benefit for me and how things went my life is that one of the one of the benefits is that I'm very acutely aware of what I have and how easily it can be lost. There's a lot of things tied up and there's a lot of things tied up in that phrase in that couplet because it's life it is career music life people that just aren't there mm -hmm. and sometimes there's aspects of you know in the in, in a couple songs before that and waiting around um kind of comparing being you know when i was young and came to amsterdam and not on any music vibe you just living going all out not that you really realize it at the time but you don't have a lot to lose you can just do whatever you feel like doing and then later in life you know you got a lot more things to take stock of and consider before you make any type of a move life is more complicated yeah that's that's something that i, I like a lot about your music is that i feel you you have a good way of articulating this kind of like i guess you could say acknowledgement of the fact that you're just here you're still here you're surviving it kind of just cuts through a lot of the noise i feel like i'm thinking of tracks like all jokes aside too where it just feels very powerful because i feel like it's a universal thing that we should all kind of be grateful for if you if you're able to if you are lucky enough to just be living being breathing with a kind of roof on roof on your head it's 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 pretty special when you think about it right I think it, it it I I think of the quote uh at the end of um charms surviving isn't merely the act of being alive you know it's saying all right I still draw breath although not to be underrated 
<laughs> you know, having seen more than a few dead people in my life, as of yet, I still believe it's probably better to be on this side of things. We'll see when it's my turn. But also just the idea that uh yeah, surviving is a victory in and of itself. And it's not just talking about just being here, but um being appreciative and able to uh uh still be a participant in growing as a person and, and mm-hmm. the world around you and your relationships and you know love happiness yeah it's powerful stuff but that's the thing is that uh sometimes you have to do without things or be without things to really learn to appreciate them you know exactly yeah i love that quote so in recent years like not just your stock but the the whole backwood studio stock has has really started to skyrocket and that's that's a great thing to see and so as the the head honcho for this label like what what kind of legacy do you feel backwards is building and how would you like it to be remembered when it's all said and done i feel like i would hope uh it'd be a legacy of putting out unique interesting and dope music hopefully a legacy of doing good business and one that you know make no mistakes it's a capitalist enterprise or business trying to make money but i do feel that uh the artist i made that i'm trying to make the sort of label that i would want to be working with in Mm -hmm. at least some ways not flawless or whatever but a lot of artists autonomy and retaining ownership of the things you make generally you know it's one album contracts and we work with people if you know if we put out your record digitally and you find somebody wants to do it on vinyl and we don't want to do it on vinyl then we're not going to block you from we want to prevent artists from getting money or anything like that so hopefully it's a place that fosters a lot of good art and a good amount of transparency in regards to finances and um and that artists chose to work with because they felt like it uh we helped you know, see through their visions or enhance them so that would be that would that would be meaningful to me yeah i think you've all like i feel like when i hear an album is getting released on backwards i think there's generally a few things that I already just kind of assume, which I think speaks to how you've been able to succeed with that vision you're describing. It's like not only that the music will be to some degree like unique or cutting edge, but also that the the way it'll be rolled out, the merch, like all that all those like business like label type stuff about it, not just the actual music itself, but the the packaging and the curation behind it, I think is always something exceptional. Like when I heard Spirit Roman was coming with uh, with a Kai on Backwoods, I was just like, wow, this is perfect. And it's no surprise. It's, I think, my favorite work of his. And I think it's just a step up in so much growth and all of that. So, and then that one, I think you exec produced, correct? Which one? Spirit Roman? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That incredible, incredible album. It really is. I, yeah, I like that record a lot. The vinyl came in. Uh, if anyone was waiting for it to cop until it's here, it's here. You should get it while you can. Um, Akai is really, really great artist. And obviously is busy doing things all over the place. So, yeah, excited to see what his next move is. Yeah, 100%. So I've been able to see him live twice in Toronto here in the past like half a year. And he just puts on an incredible show. He really does. So not only are you like obviously a solo artist, you have amazing work as Arm and Hammer teaming up with Elucid. So I have I have a patron question now, uh, coming from a person named Fick. Obviously, if anybody else would like to participate in these convos, you know what to do: become a patron. But Fick asks, how does working with an artist like Elucid impact your performance as a rapper? And like, what do you get out of that creative experience that you can't get uh, working just as a solo artist? I think that 
it's clear to me and i mean it's part of the reason that um even here is uh really coming out of a pretty disastrous earlier era uh, of the label and my career was um choosing and don't get me wrong i had a lot of great collaborators throughout my entire career people around me but um being more intentional about who I was working with and how. And um, I don't think it's any sort of mistake that uh, things really um, went better for me uh, in the wake of really committing to work with Olusen, Willie Green. I mean, Willie Green was from before then, but like um, only a little bit before. Uh, and I guess, yeah, there's no doubt that it's made me a better rapper, artist, everything. And he's a very good friend of mine. Um, as far as working with any great, truly really great artist or person in any field, I feel like uh, you learn things. You learn new ways to approach your art form. You see ways that they do things or they give you advice on how you do things the natural desire to meet certain standards to not be outshone to um to raise the bar if the other person is constantly raising the bar mm -hmm. all of those things play a significant role um on top of that i think that uh not only do i come out of every Arm and Hammer record with hopefully a few new tricks, ideas, approaches, but it also allows me time to step away from solo work and enter into a sort of different creative process and chamber. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really valuable to maintaining some level of freshness and energy in my solo work as well. And it's funny because sometimes people are like, oh, you put out so many records, you put out so many records. And part of that is that I don't put out that many solo records. Of course, right now in this exact moment, there have been three over the course of the past two years, a little less than two years. But before that, there hadn't been a solo record for years. Yeah. It's just that there was brass, there were shrines, there was Haram. So it allows me to still keep being creative, making art, yet not always have to sit down and say, okay, it's just me and this blank page. Like when I go to work on an Arm and Hammer record, just by obviously it doesn't break down this simply, but just by common sense, I have 50% less work to do. Yeah. And there's, Another source for ideas, for energy, concepts, production, everything now. There's somebody else, and not just somebody, but one of the best artists in the entire genre to bounce ideas off of and do things with. So that's pretty invaluable. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, something that you're saying, like you always come out of these, any collaboration, but I'll just take Arm & Hammer specifically with something like you've learned. I feel like something that I know Lucid is just always been gifted at that I feel I've noticed over time with you has just become more of a strength over time is like the songwriting, the hooks, those kind of qualities of a record. Because on maps, that's one of the main takeaways I took is that all the hooks are just so sticky. They're just so like they just get stuck in my freaking uh, head. And I love it. I think that's something that you've definitely gotten better and better at over time. Sure. Yeah. I could agree. And so like word on the street is that there is an upcoming Arm & Hammer album dropping soon. Could you share anything further detail on that or how that'll look like and uh, when it would come out? I think it's in the fall. So soon would be an exaggeration. And what would be like, do you, can you say anything about how it'll sound or any kind of inspirations related to it? <laughs> very different. Sounds very different from Rob. Okay, so I want to get into a bit of like your, your writing style, because something that I love about the way you write is that 
I feel like it. you write in a way that's kind of slippery in the sense that there's a lot of different dimensions, a lot of things, different things going on at the same time. It's something that I really loved in some moments on Atheops in particular, on like tracks like No Hard Feelings, where isolated verses, some certain like remarks, references, they all kind of built in or like led to this kind of overall connection, this theme of this no hard feelings idea and through like the the black astronaut reference, the 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 crack user outside uh the apartment getting stood up by a girl. It's just remarkable I find how your raps can function on so many different levels and how you can contextualize it all into making like a, a very interesting commentary. So how does your writing process really look like? Do you do you start with kind of more of like a theme or an idea and then put together lyrics to back that up? Or do you just start writing more stream of consciousness until patterns start to arise? Depends. Yeah, if you pick different songs, I could tell you how they came about. Um, but it's really uh, it's really dependent on the, the particular situation. So for example, uh, the song No Hard Feelings, is what you use as an example. Mm -hmm. The situation with the guy had already begun happening. Okay, a couple different factors. One, I had had the idea of using that phrase for in a song in the title or something. I found it an interesting, it's interesting because it's like no hard feelings on the one hand. Hey, I'm have to do this. It's no, hoping it's no bad blood between us. Mm -hmm. But you could also bend it a little bit literally and say, hey, I don't want to have hard feelings, you know, in terms of not bad feelings for somebody, but deal with difficult emotions, for example. So that interested me, first of all, just in terms of the different ways that you can interpret that word. And then I thought I had this situation developed. And so as I'm sitting at my desk trying to do some writing, this is during the pandemic, it had become a regular thing for maybe a week, maybe a little less than a week at that point. And this guy kept being on the steps. Uh, you know, he'd been in an area, you know, one or two block radius for a minute, but I'm sitting trying to work and he's right next to my window in a state of uh, delirium psychosis, smoking crack or just hitting the empty pipe. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I started writing it from there as it was happening because um, it had already been a thing where I dealt with the emotions of, oh, why, you know, why is this guy all of a sudden on my steps? This is unpleasant and annoying. I have to navigate past this dude every time or be in my room and hear him um, when I'm just trying to sit at the desk, look over to my right and see him right there. Um, and then the other hand, of course, you know, sympathy for this person mm -hmm. is obviously not only saddled with a serious drug addiction, but appears to be mentally only partially there. Sometimes in, you know, in life, it's like uh, some of these addiction takes them to a place where it's almost like they're just a, the only purpose is the consumption of this drug. Yeah. Physically, you almost wonder how the person could be alive, but it's like it keeps everything humming so that they can continue to uh, to do the drugs. And um, so I'm just sitting there writing and start writing about just what's happening. And um, over the course of working on that song, I've been like, yo, you know, eventually I was like, I can kind of, this kind of isn't working. And he might get his stuff a little bit and then leave and then come back. And yeah, I felt weird about the whole scenario. And then one day the super for the building, who's from the he's from the block, big dude. He must have spotted the guy there for the first time. And he just went off like, yo, you better get off those steps. If I see here, you're here, here again. XYZ. Dude left, never came back. And I was thinking about the, um, now everybody involved in this situation, this is a, primarily a black neighborhood. Everybody involved in these interactions was black, although the building belongs to none of us. 
on the one hand, I felt bad, you know, that the this dude was like, if I see you here again, you're gonna be sorry. Yeah. And a homie got his stuff and was out, never sat on this, never came back there once. So I was relieved that I, this problem had been taken out of my life, but also, you know, uh, uh, felt a certain level of guilt and embarrassment about how it occurred. All of these things happening all at the same time, you know? So that's what the song is about. And then it, uh, you know, that's the surface and you dig and dig deeper into it. And then the second verse was sort of a different demonstration of the same, of a different side of the same sentiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's what I really like about, because I find I noticed that a lot in your music and I find it's not an easy thing to pull off in the sense that it can, in lesser hands, just kind of come off scattered or confusing where you're just like, what, what am I, what was the point of this? It just seems almost nonsensical, but the way you do it always just seems like, you don't, I find you're very good at articulating those kind of connections, even if on the surface, they're not maybe related. Yeah. I mean, that's a difficult song to write. A difficult song that I think I could have made as deftly 10 years ago. Um, but yeah, that's a, that was a, that was a tougher one to write, but also it, it came about as a combination of all those things. I was writing something that was actually happening and I started writing it before I even knew the resolution because it was before the super saw the guy. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I'm drawing upon sort of other lived experiences. Like the second verse was not happening right at that time. Um, and I'm also had some inkling of a concept or of an idea because I had already been carrying around this little note to myself of like, no hard feelings and then something came that uh, was like oh this is where it works so before we get into this new album maps i wanted to briefly touch on those two incredible solo records or collaborative rap records but you're the solo rapper there um that you dropped last year and ate the oaks in church by going into talking about some of the key themes there so starting with ate the oaks even by your standards this record features some of your richest commentary on like history, capitalism, colonialism, and so on. What, what would you say is the driving force behind you focusing on these kinds of ideas in your lyrics? And like, do you feel that people generally are understanding what you're actually trying to convey in these songs? Well, yes and no. It depends. A lot of times, especially nowadays, uh, people come to material and discussions about politics and society with sort of preconceived ideas and notions which they uh they superimpose on anything that might seem like it could fit you know there's situations where um i guess for me like that album is about those things it's also very much about identity it's about africa as an idea it's creation is an, of itself is an idea, you know, and all the different ways in which the idea of Africa can and has been used by various people, including Africans themselves for various types of purposes. You know, I'm half Jamaican and, um, you know, the Rastafarian viewpoint, like, uh, as someone who grew up in Africa was always a bit preposterous to me or, um, these situations where Africa becomes, you know, uh, like in belly when Nas is like, we're just going to go to Africa. Mm. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a stand in. It's an idea. It's not like a actual place. And similarly, I mean, Europeans created the idea of Africa and blackness people in Africa didn't all think that they were the same or, mm -hmm. Everyone in Africa didn't think, oh, we're, we're Africans. You know, that's something that's created. And similarly, how the creation of Africa is a mirror of sorts to the creation of the very idea of whiteness and being European and interrogating all of those things, really. Not as simple as just like, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to, um, 
I wouldn't want to make an album in 2023 or 2022 or whatever, where the main thesis is colonialism is bad, was bad. Right. I know that there are still people who may be unaware and need to know about that. But, you know, that was something that I was being told when I was growing up half a lifetime ago. Yeah. So hopefully I'd have something more insightful or interesting to add to the conversation than that, which is what I, I, I think is part of it. Like, what are the legacies of colonialism? Because colonialism didn't only change Africa and Africans, it changed Europeans. Mm-hmm. 100%. And it provided the template for to define what is European and what was not. Yet so many things that you think of as being one or the other are, in fact, the result of there's imagined purity that never existed, you know, like English people wanting to go back to their traditions, like the tea that you drink. That's a big part of it. It's from weed is in Jamaica because of like all the Jamaicans are associated with marijuana and ganja and Rastafari. It's called ganja because the Ganges river, because of Indian people, part of the British empire, who were brought to the Caribbean to serve as a sort of trader class, mm. you know, who owned the stores and the markets. And they, I mean, Jamaican food, obviously the patty is a version of a samosa, you know, um, West Indian curry, and how all of these things flowed back and forth and had for a long time. And the idea of racial purity is mostly, and cultural purity is uh, is in people's minds. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like you really captured, like you said, you didn't just make an album that said, hey, guys, colonialism is bad. Do you know that? Like, I think that the level of nuance and detail you put in there was really interesting, especially for people that I imagine are, even for people that are, I think, decently well read. I think it you still can, like, pick up some interesting nuggets and different kind of perspectives to your point that like actually add something of substance that's like fresh to the conversation. That's really what I was trying to do. And I guess I, when you ask, do people understand? A lot of people just want you to tell them that everything that they already think is correct. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes you might be correct, but it, it, it's always helpful uh, to have some level of, uh, of questioning your own belief systems and your own your own assumptions. Yeah, so I guess that's that's my answer to your question about Ethiopes. I don't know how much it offers, like answers so much, but opening different doors, asking different questions and pointing out different things about ideas of identity, the idea of Africa, the idea of Europe, meanings of post-colonialism, colonialism, neo-colonialism, race, something that is simultaneously it i it's interesting because i think of that in relation to when i did the rachel dola's all line on the one hand it's you know having a laugh and on the other hand it's acknowledging the fact that um things that you assume and that you feel the world operates in one way you, you may find that time will pass and people will decide something else Side it will move in different ways. Let's understand mm -hmm. this will change. It's totally conceivable that a time could come where people would be like somebody like Rachel Dolezal was attempting to uh, transcend ideas we have about race, racial purity, where from wherever they may have sprung, mm -hmm. and even thinking about ideas of like. Once upon a time, you know, like there was this one drop rule to maintain an idea of white purity and that allowed people to do crazy things like, oh, well, I'm selling my actual children into slavery. Like you have slave master has children. People know that these are his children, mm -hmm. but they're black because that's that allows him the mental space to do what he needs to do later on in when we come to a totally different era of pro-black thinking and liberation, we move from a time when 
people who could try to pass would try to pass into a time where blackness in all its forms is being gathering under a tent of liberation. And, you know, if you're, if the 1% rule turned on its head instead of something to be ashamed of, something that you're being brave about and proclaiming your black, your blackness and everybody being like black, well, I'm embracing this. And then later on, you come to, eventually we will come to the point at which people are going to question some of the ideas, purposes, and usefulness of ideas about race, period. It's been interesting in my life. It was always interesting to travel from place to place and see how race is not an inviolate, like, uh, inviolate. It's not a, um, it changes depending where you are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you could be in Southern Africa where I grew up, you know? People would ask me if my mother was Jamaican, a light-skinned woman, if she was colored, which in that region of the world, you have black, you have colored as anyone who's a mixed race. Mm -hmm. And you had, I mean, also like Indian, other classifications, and you had white. This idea that blackness is like a person who's only black, quote unquote. Yeah. Uh, would not make sense here. You know, how many America is a hugely miscegenated society. Lots of mixture people, black people here could look all types of ways, you know what I mean? And you'd still be black in in the context of a place like Zimbabwe or South Africa. It's a visual component. Mm -hmm that is very compelling and so to a certain extent seeing not only that but then seeing how in jamaica where my mother lives where my mother grew up you know you have a funeral or something and there'll be people there who i'm like who is this white lady and hmm. everybody is doesn't know who you're talking about yeah to them whiteness is not so much the color of skin but the cultural background, right? It's a society where lots and lots of race mixing um, without, it has its own, that's the thing. All of these things about race come out of places on individual cultural developments, you know? Like yeah. if you're in Guyana and you're Indian in Guyana, those same people could go back to India and people would be like, you're not Indian. Seeing how malleable races and how much people f move it to fit what they perceive but then if you're in that society those perceptions become like hard and fast like laws for you yeah it doesn't do any good to point out oh well in this in this place i'm not black doesn't matter if the place yeah you're <laughs> black, you know um yeah. and similarly if you go somewhere else they could have a totally different definition of what that means and what it should be. And you are at the mercy of what other, and that's the other thing about identity. You're at the mercy of other people's perceptions of you. You can say whatever you want. You know, you could be a white person and say, I feel transracialist. You know, I feel that I'm black. If people refuse to accept that, um, then you just won't be. Yeah. Unless you, and that would what would drive you to lie to somebody and similarly you could you, you know I, like i've known i've known people who uh there's so many little ways in which it operates for example you could be from a totally different country and be in the u.s and somebody refers to you as dark skin and you might say oh i'm not dark skin in their minds as an american they may think you're trying to avoid the negative racial identification of being a dark skinned person here. Yeah. Obviously, they might be from somewhere where the, most people are their color. So when those people think about people who are dark skinned, they think about yeah. a, another level of dark skinness or lightness or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. You know, the, my mother was a light skinned woman in. Zimbabwe, I don't think in the American context, 
she wasn't anyone looking at her would have been like this is just a black woman but again all of these things are are, are, are um they're like conditional yeah all of these things are conditional all of these yeah. things are conditional and contextual yeah i was saying that about i knew this guyanese woman in indian guyanese woman or thought of herself as indian and um she said that when she first went to india for the first time have you do you know any guyanese people yeah i do like indian guyanese people uh yes yeah well when she went back there people didn't you know it wasn't it wasn't like except she wasn't accepted as being indian or mm -hmm. oh yeah 100 percent. yeah they're like you're basically black to them yeah it's funny like even like in india like uh like right now it's just there's not exactly the same kind of point you're making but it's just interesting how things differ from country to country area to area because like Right now, everybody's trying to, the, the trend is to be like tanner, right? Like people, like white people want to tan, tan themselves constantly to not be very pale. Whereas if you're in India, although it's like becoming a little less in fashion, it's still, they still have like lightning cream. And if you're too dark as an Indian person, like your family will just be like, oh, you should, yo, don't, don't put some sunscreen. Like don't, 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 don't stand so much in the sun. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's crazy how that still happens and how like, especially especially from white people for it to be very predominantly a popular thing now to tan in white cultures where that's like a huge reason why a lot of this kind of perception and this uh like uh d discouraging of like darker skin in these other cultures are very related to like historical colonialism and things like that it's just it there's there's yeah there's so much you can go with that so another one of the reasons i i feel like i connect with your music outside of just more of like the I guess you could say like intellectual or things that I can learn from a historical perspective are the fact that you really do talk about women and relationships in a really interesting way. And as a person that I feel has had my life pretty impacted by romance related experiences, I, I just really relate to it. And I think the way you do it is interesting because some points it's, it's more, it, it's said in a way that's like subversive or, and then other times it's said in a very tender way where you're expressing like very sincere heartbreak and sincere appreciation or things along those lines, especially on albums like Church. So like, why do you feel relationships and, you know, how they sometimes fall apart end up being such a recurring topic in your rhymes? I mean, what is what are what are the things in human life, you know, that that are our shared experiences and our most meaningful experiences? Obviously, love both romantic and non-romantic are huge things in terms of even if you're talking about the absence of them exactly you know violence love hate grief you know these are the things that resonate with us and people are never going to stop being interested in stories of love's gain and lost so I think that love is one of those enduring things of the human experience that is always going to be compelling um, and relationships. And then I think there's also the aspect in which sometimes I, yeah, let me not speak on what other people do for me, myself, I just wanted to try and write from places that I knew. So that's where a lot of those things start. And uh, I mean, I'm, write them because they're compelling to me you know and mm -hmm. so the hopes that they're compelling to other people um and or that you can find ways to make them such i just always try to focus on what i can do in my music or what to make it and i don't ever want it to be like a cliche thing but yeah I, I, to me it's normal as normal to talk about relationships and love, romantic love, or something like that, um, and sex as it is to talk about, you know, violence and anger and frustration and joy. I mean, these are the things that make up my life. Yeah, and I think for you, especially given the other non, like given, like if I just think of other rappers, again, no need to name names, that talk about similar topics you do, a lot of times these rappers don't actually really touch on the love and 
relationship romance angle all that much so i feel like it really adds like something special to your music because it's just kind of because whenever i hear a song where it's more focused or some lines where it's more focused on this kind of love topic or just putting that broadly it's said in the context of a lot of other different kinds of ideas and then as a skilled writer as yourself like the way you're able to kind of again put different ideas together in a way that actually make them connect in some way it just like adds to the experience as a listener there's just a lot more i can take from it that's cool i mean i yeah i will say that um in all of these things sometimes you know there are times you sit down and you think oh do i actually want to write that or do i want to write this or and learning how to um let go of self-consciousness about certain things is important yeah especially given how honest you write i imagine that's a thing you need to manage pretty often yeah i mean well and again everybody has different types of music so it's not well, my music is not like um the narrator is just not detailing a endless string of successes you know it's like <laughs> it's like life <laughs> life happens yeah. um and also sometimes people describe it as being, and I mean, there are some bleak records. I mean, Hiding Places is one of them, but I don't really, sometimes I'm like, man, that record wasn't like bleak. There are some bleak records and then other records I'm like, people make it seem like all of it is like, and I'm like, no, it's not like that. I don't know. You know, and unknowns. Um, one of my favorite I don't know if you could call it a relationship song or not, but like Fall Back, I love that record. Oh, that's a classic. I wrote from a place of a uh, pretty profound sadness about the situation, but the song is pretty funny, I think. You know, it's a lot of things. Anyway, I guess that's the point. I hope that there's a lot of nuance to the work in general. Um whatever the topic is yeah and and like speaking of nuance and just records that i feel don't necessarily feel like one single thing is this new album maps because i feel like i mean i've listened to this album so many times and i and i feel like it just it makes me feel different things and it doesn't it's not doesn't feel as focused on like doesn't give me one particular emotion like all your records but this one specifically i feel had a really nice balance what was your mind state going into creating this album and like how does it stand out in your catalog if at all at first you know you start off you're not exactly sure i didn't know exactly what the record was going to be but once it sort of settled in um the first song the first session was in la and i did um rapper weed yeah rapper weed another song that turned into an arm and hammer well, yes, another song that turned into an Arm and Hammer song that I don't know where it will end up, but I really like it, but it didn't end up being a record that belonged on this record. And then um, it was just those two at first. Um, but Rapper We definitely stuck, and so it kind of was just going from there, but I didn't know from the beginning exactly what it was going to be in terms of the concept or the record or anything like that. Um, and so as a result of how I was working on it, which was mostly on the road, I tried not to work on it a whole lot when I was in New York, except for you know, New York City tap water, which I did at the end. I did that after getting back from a long tour, the last two songs. I was actually in the perspective and space of uh, of what I was doing, you know, in terms of the, in terms of all the different sort of mental spaces and physical spaces that that type of travel and touring and everything put me in, you know. Yeah, I was working at I was writing in hotels. I was writing in uh, Airbnbs and airports, and sometimes at home, you know, because sometimes you write some of an idea then finish it later. Um, I was writing at Kenny's house because I went out there for a couple sessions. I was writing at my people's in Portland. 
Uh, I recorded at least like two things at Aesop Rock's place. Big ups to him. I know I recorded at least one thing at Alchemist's place. At least the original, the original take of it. And yeah, just uh, those sort of vibes. Uh, Japan, I started what eventually became Waiting Around in Brussels after uh, not being able to the, the situate, the scenario that's played out in the song of, or the overarching idea, which is like being stuck in Brussels. I tried to leave, couldn't fly home, came back, had to get the hotel for another day. Uh, and then I started writing and it eventually came around into the final song, but that's where it started. So I guess, you know, um, that sort of situation, your uh, emotions and everything kind of run the gamut a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you're homesick. Sometimes you're happy to be gone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cause it's nice to be on the road. So now it's nice to be away from like, all the shit you have to deal with at home. Sometimes you're lonely and sad. Sometimes uh, I was killing time, which is all over the record. Sometimes it felt like there wasn't enough time, which hopefully is all over the record too. I was bumping into other artists as I moved around, which is how a lot of the features happen. Like me and Danny both played Oblivion Access Festival. In Austin, Word. Texas. Yeah. And um man, that was a funny backstage there. Uh do you know who Soul Glow is? Yeah, they're crazy. Yeah, so um Pierce from Soul Glow is backstage. I already know him. There's a whole bunch of different people backstage, but uh a conversation between me, Danny Brown, and Pierce, and just watching Danny Brown and Pierce interact actually was yeah, that was funny enough. Um, but I ended up getting Danny's contact information and we were like, yeah, let's do it. And then he actually, it actually happened, ended up happening in New York way later. And he just rolled through. I mean, the story of that session is, that's its own story. But yeah, so those types of crazy connections, um, agriculture, like that's something that came to me from traveling and being out there um, and seeing people again these are all each one of these songs has its own story or thing that probably i could relate it to things that put you in the space where it is but yeah because i was traveling around and things really ran the gamut yeah i think that's really you can really hear that i feel like they all feel like kind of snapshots of situations and then what you're saying of this of course like whatever's on your mind and i feel like that's a way that it feels different than hiding places and that the way it's constructed like there's more tracks there's there's a lot of shorter tracks and i feel like unlike hiding places that had some more moments i feel like they were like bombastic or claustrophobic if you will like like checkpoints steak knives this one is a bit more even keel, I find. Doesn't mean it's like samey though, because it kind of just, I feel like it revolves around a more consistent baseline of tone or energy. And that home base of Kenny's drums are insane. The hiding places reflected the time that it was made. It wasn't like an affectation. I was absolutely listening to an album of a person who's being trapped by life. By right. Forces both within and beyond their control. They're a prisoner, you know. Um, they're they're they're. It is claustrophobic. The 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 walls are closing in. You know. Mm -hmm. That's what was happening. Exactly. You know, and also at the same time, um, hiding places has a, another subtext that's very much about childhood. And, yeah. Yeah, so I feel like all of, all of those things are happening there because that's what was happening then. Um, and yeah, there's more room. This is not a claustrophobic album because yeah, nothing claustro. If anything, I was. It's the moving around the space that lends mm -hmm. itself to a feeling of unmoored, of being unmoored. 
you know um, yeah you feel much less burdened but, like but different yeah, burdens too yeah for sure for sure where do you fit into things as you travel around what is the what 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 is the future and the other one uh yeah it's a person who's being suffocated in hiding places this is a person who is everywhere and nowhere at the same time and trying to make sense of that yeah that, that i think and i think that's what i love about both these records i feel from lyrics from you to kenny's uh, production they just do a great job of conveying that and so like Working with Kenny a second time, like what's it about his particular style of beat making that just makes you come back for more? I'll be honest, I don't think too much about how people make beats because or what I'm not I never learned how to make beats. And although sometimes I've worked collaboratively with producers to do particular songs like Fever Grass with me and Messiah was a really collaborative process on how that song. right. A lot of collaborations are me thinking, does it seem like it would be interesting? Um, and am I interested in doing it? The Kenny situation was a no brainer once we did it the first time. So if you're asking me why I did it the second time, it was because <laughs> the first time went really well and we really got along and discovered in the process, lots of personal connections and it was very successful. So it's like, are they going to be afraid of it or come back to it? It's easy to come back to it when we're homies, you know? So um, it was known that we would do something together again. I think Kenny and I were one song together in the past four or five years or whatever, mm -hmm. um, which is not even a, it's an Arm and Hammer song, uh, Dead Cars. So uh, other than that, I haven't, Wrapped on any Kenny Siegel beats, we've steered clear with the knowledge. Like we're going to, we're going to connect again, and we'll see what we do then. What do I appreciate about him as a producer? Um, well, you know, it's interesting because I, I I had a conversation like this, and you know, a lot of people are not into comparing arts or creating hierarchies, and that's good. Or, I mean, nothing's good or bad, but I can see how that's good. And I don't ultimately think that, you know, these things matter. But okay. like I said in the song, you need something to get from one day to the next. So mm -hmm. just theoretically discussing it when I'm talking about it, I think of like Kenny's work uh, and where he is. At. If you were talking about best producers today, I feel like... Um, he should be in that conversation. I mean, I, I would say that only if somebody was to say a knock against him is he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't put out a ton of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I do also have to give credit to somebody like, like you don't just get credit for putting out a ton of stuff no matter what. But if you're able to be uh, prolific, well, all and quality, yeah, high quality projects, i.e. somebody like the alchemist i think that's laudable you know that's really dope but where kenny does have really good arguments is i think um when he has he has he has some really strong instrumental work and when he is locked in with artists he's been able to produce work that is widely considered some of their best and, you know, I think if you were to look at, like, great indie rap albums over the last 10 years, I mean, I feel like Kenny Siegel has a couple pretty high-slotted entries in there, according to my biased opinion. And so that's, it says a lot. It says a lot. And if you looked at any artists we did work with, whether it's, you know, even if it's not one of the more high-profile of, you know, like a, an album like So the Flies Don't Come is more high profile than um than let's say uh Hemlock Ernst album. Right. That's Hemlock Ernst is like a side project or had been a side project for Sam. 
And that album is held in high regard mm -hmm. as far as Hemlock Ernst material that we have. Or looking at somebody like Serengeti, who's done a grip of work, like, dude is a mm -hmm. legend. You know, so yeah. amazing legend. But if you were like, what are the standout Serengeti projects over the last 10? I feel like Ajay, which is saying a lot because this is a guy who is the most prolific. You know what I mean? In terms mm -hmm. of that, he has so many albums. And I still feel like you can make an, an argument for a Jai. Like if somebody were putting together a thing to figure out what the best Serengeti album is, I feel like a Jai would end up pretty high in a ranking. You know, me. Yeah, 100%. Like, well, yeah. I know with a Serengeti ranking system like that, it would just turn into a mosh pit because it's so many records and so many and there's so many different styles it's like yeah, it's so just, many different yeah. styles so it's like eventually you're really just depending on what like you personally for me it's going to be family and friends but i do feel like uh just even being able to make a record with somebody as prolific as serengeti and have it register um as being unique and memorable and stick out in their catalog is really hard you know? Yeah, I think Ken Kenny's beats just like breathe. They like live. They just transform. They evolve. Like he's so it's so effortless the way everything feels like like a living organism. And he has such like dynamic like versatility. So like you can get these just like rapper weed type beats. They're just just the drums are the drums on this whole album are are amazing to be clear. But the, all those like nice instrumental flourishes with the horns and the the violins and stuff at times it's just. It's really people don't do it much better than Kenny Siegel. Well, yeah. see, okay, so you said a lot of things that I think they're interesting. One is that I do think he is one of the most, he, he is really unique in his approach, his style, and how he makes beats. Mm -hmm. And so he's one of those people, I guess when I, there, there are people, producers who I think are incredible, right? Like, I am a big Mad Lib fan. You know, I always was a fan of like the RZA heavy, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's a certain aspect to what, to what they do that it's like inevitably, um, people are going to follow, you know, and, and what they do is it's not like you can just flip it on and be the RZA, but you can be like, here, I'm going to make RZA type beats. You know? Yeah, yeah, you can. The process isn't necessarily super out there, you know. Yeah, of, exactly. Yeah. It's where people can, and that's you know, that's how these men became icons because they dictated that. And Kenny is in a different category where I don't really think anyone can like make Kenny Siegel beats. Yeah, 100%. Question of if you like the beat or not, like you're not mm -hmm. able to be like, oh, I'm gonna be the next, like his, his, for a bunch of reasons, his music is just the end result is really unique in terms of his production and how it sounds and everything you know um i think it's a combination of uh his own background and where he's coming from you know with project bloat and um building off of where he came into the game with those guys and and then the fact that he works on non-rap music a lot so it gets introduced to different people and techniques and things and he has this crew of friends who like are also musicians and they live they're like homies and for 20 years all know each other and it's like yo this dude might drop by and play some bass guitar for you you know no problem he lives like five minutes away it's your old school homie like that's a hard thing for people to replicate yeah exactly um, there's just a lot of cross pollination happening with all this like yeah. interesting and right? physically being able to be like yo my man lives three blocks away come through and play the horn mm -hmm. between smoke sessions or whatever and then the third thing is he has a lot of really unique i gotta assume just drawn from his own personal experience uh sensibilities about music Mm. And um, they govern a lot of his, uh, I think the combination of all those three things, um, the way that he's plugged in with a lot of uh, other musicians and people, 
um, his own background and the scene that he came out of and the LA beat scene. And sometimes I think, especially being out here, uh, a lot of production I get is from East Coast and East Coast influence sources. And mm -hmm. it's just a different type of vibe to a certain extent. And also um, his own his own professional experience, you know, uh, what type of equipment he uses and how he came up making music and how that's affected his own view. It is very unique stuff. And so I guess it's, it's, it's especially interesting to engage with in a full project because, um, yeah, you just know that you're going to be digging some holes that you're not going to dig anywhere else sonically. Yeah, I, I love the on this album. Just maybe I would dare to say this is like the best flowing album you've ever had because it's just no one second sounds just kind of a bit off or maybe that doesn't really exactly relate to the last song, like musically, at least it's just phenomenal and the progressions of the beats just are so subtle at times but they add a lot even like the last track where i feel like there's just i don't remember what this, the instrument is but there's just a little like nice little pretty sounds that end the, the 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 whole album off that are just so chef's kiss that i don't know other producers even think of doing or have that wherewithal to do so yeah um, he, and he's great with the progressions and changes in the beats you said two other things that I wanted to come back to, though, or we just said something, you said something earlier. First of all is I know it's not something that we talked about or put out of there at all. Um, but I know that uh, I feel like Kenny, yeah, he really took him to school with the drums on here. And oh, I yeah. feel like um, as people who can and do, I mean, I've rapped on lots of quote unquote drumless beats. And I'm totally with that. It's all good. It's cool to do something that's, you know, in its own lane or sometimes to go against the grain a little bit. And so it's like, oh, well, you know, there's some pretty prominent drum work in this album. Um, and I, I like that. I like that a lot. And I like that it starts off with like, like, and the first song, how that ended up happening is its own is its own whole thing but um yeah so anyway i wanted to give kenny his props for the drums you mentioned it and i think it's it, it's noteworthy and i know that for him as a beat maker like there have been records where i was like you know what i'm gonna do this record and i'm not gonna really talk about any weed you just to like i want to test myself a little bit just this little mm -hmm. side thing i'm not gonna make these type of references um yeah or whatever type of thing that you decide to do um i think there was some level on this where he was like i'm about to hook up some drums on this record <laughs> yeah it's like i want to hear some drums on this record and uh I, I dig it yeah the other thing interesting thing is you know we did a decent amount of this album together in LA and so sometimes I was coming there with beats that I got in advance and had started you know I'm writing in Japan or I'm writing in wherever I'm at and then right. coming there and flipping it or finalizing it or whatever even the first song Rapper Weed I kind of had the idea and some things sketched out and then when I came back that's when I wrote it and that was a while ago when we did that first song and so each of these songs kind of has its own little uh, has its own little origin story that I think are all pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, doing the doing something like um, Babylon by Bus, like when I got that, like that was already sort of how it is. Oh, so the beat, the progression was like how he oh, sent it to you originally? Oh, had been made like that. That's wild. So the other thing about, see, now I'm like, what things are okay to mention? I feel like this one is okay to mention. So that is like a Paul Barman song that I guess oh. never came out. 
Paul Barman is, uh, I see him because he's homies with Steel Tip Dub. Very, very, very cool. Yeah. Fuck with Paul Barman. Um, and he'll just drop by dubs. Yo, this guy has so much recorded music that he just doesn't put out, which of course is his own affairs. Mm -hmm. But he has so much recorded music. And I think he's just one of those people that kind of reminds me of, of uh, my friend uh, Myra, who I do a lot of art with. And she's easy to collaborate with. Left to her own devices, she'll like do 93% of a painting and then be like, it's not done. So I have to figure out what I'm going to do about this one minor thing and then mm -hmm. cause it for years. And I'm like, how can you do that? Like, I would rather just whatever. I spent so much time and energy on this. Mm -hmm. just, I got to get it out of there. Um, but I feel like Paul is just always like, yeah, it's done. But having a different idea for this one thing or whatever, um, because he has so much music, it's crazy. Um, Anyway, I guess he had done the song and then never did it. And, and it, he like decided he didn't like the end song. He wanted to rework some the whole thing. So I was at Kenny's. At a certain point, I started being like, oh, play me some other stuff that you have or whatever. And so this is later in the process um, when I'm staying out there trying to, you know, get as much work done on the album in between breaks and tours as I can. Mm -hmm. And so I start getting him to play me some other things that he already has. You know, we made a couple things on the spot, then he's going through other things he already has. And that was one of them. And we were like, well, I was like, wow, this is crazy. And that's when I was like, maybe we should get shrapnel in this part. And I hit them up. And then they were like, 100% we'll do it. Because it was also on some like, kind of want to do it now. You know, because I'm only got this little break and I know that I should come in and rap on the last part. And so it's like, who are some soldiers that you can be like, oh, they're going to be ready to go right now. And actually, yeah. it's so quickly. They like message me. We're like, we're done. And I was like, <laughs> oh, don't. Don't make it a rush job. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, cool. And they were like, no, we're done. It's not a rush job. It's good. And um, and they sent it, and it indeed was not a rush job, and it was was pretty hectic. And then I just wrote the end right there. So it was it went. That's how the song organically happened. A lot of a lot of interesting stories to the different productions and songs on there. Like uh, Kenwood Speakers was man a lot of attempts at making the opener for this album preceded that one yeah that's a that's a really jarring way to start the album like it definitely sticks out amongst the rest <laughs> yeah i think uh yeah he met yeah that is crazy like i said there's crazy stories for all of these <laughs> Yeah, and I understand that you and Kenny wanted to didn't want to make a hiding places too, and I think it's safe to say that you succeeded in in doing so. And but one way that I do feel this reminds me of hiding places is that although you were you have been and still are introspective on like all your albums to some degree, I feel like hiding places was one moment in a record earlier in your career where I felt you were just direct. Uh, you were introspective in a very direct way more so than normal i felt and i feel with this with maps i feel that kind of similar feeling i feel like you're very transparently talking about your life in a in a very direct fashion and a specific song that particularly comes to mind is that final closing song which is just incredible and in this verse i may be wrong so correct me if i'm wrong please but i feel like it's one of the first times if not the first time you've directly touched on your children in the music in like an actual lyric and the way you do it, obviously, is, is very straightforward, sobering. You sound appreciative, but also, you know, morose or reflecting on mortality in a, in a way. And I wonder, like, how just generally being a father has affected how you've approached your career and what you choose to rap about in your music. I think that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if there's a simple answer. 
I guess being a father makes me have more bills. So that affects how, but even there, it's a little bit, at the time I was making Hiding Places, which went on to become one of the more financially successful albums we had. Um, even though the initial run was only 600, 500 regular and 100 of the um, yellow vinyl, mm -hmm. the alternate vinyl. I was preparing to become a father then. I think that, um, but I wasn't thinking about that when I was making the record. And I don't right. really think about anything like that when I'm working on music. Other than that, I guess, you know, all of my, all of my art stems from my external life and my internal life, really, my past. And uh, and my presence, I don't know the future. So um, my present is impacted by having children and my lived experience and things that are going on with me are more likely to involve children or thoughts and things that are brought about by having children. And since that's how I really make art, it'll show itself there. Now that said, you know, on church, I mean, I feel like there have got to be other pretty explicit references to my children. I think that that one is perhaps just the most affecting. Yeah, I think that's what I mean. Like you, you have lines that are maybe sometimes even funny, like uh, that reference, like the idea of something in relation to children. But it, yeah, I guess that's what I meant, really. It's just, yeah, I think it's affecting. It's an affecting idea. But that, yeah, I mean, I do feel like it's like, uh, I remember Alex Richter first said to me when he first heard the album, he was like, oh, why didn't you just have New York City tap water be the end? And I'm like, New York City tap water, literally, I knew that I wanted to make the song. I wrote the title down. And I wrote the first line, one city, one sip of New York, that whole thing, one sip of yeah. New York City tap water, I backed out it. You lack the minerals and vitamins, whatever. I wrote that down. I was in fucking somewhere in Western Europe. I want to say I was in Germany. And I was like, that's the idea. But I decided not to write any more of it until I got back there. And then I got home and I wrote the whole song over the next like 48, 72 hours, something like that. And that's really the period of time I wanted it to reflect that first like bit of getting home. I've been on the road for a long time and right and torn between these different places and things. And um, and of course this city itself is this constantly evolving organism that when you're away from it, um you come home and you find that home is different, came home to is home different from the one you left. Mm -hmm. without trying to go to hero's journey on it. Um, so incorporating all of these sorts of things, but I just wanted to write it when I was in the moment, like I had done with a lot of the things on the record. So I just left that on entry. I came home, I did the whole song. I feel like that's good, but I wanted to get to another, the place beyond that initial, like being split and just being like, no, I'm home. And right. I think Elusive's verse is great because it's like he talks about travel in it and touring and stuff like that, but he's doing these sort of quiet around the house mundane tasks, you know, getting his stacking the dishes in order. Yeah, cleaning out the kitchen. Yeah, doing all of these things. And it really feels more, it gives this settled in and domestic feeling while there's still all of this sense of movement, you know, um, mm -hmm. talking about bags on a carousel loop and all of this stuff and how, what is work and all of these ideas that he introduces, um, it really brings that domesticity and that allows me to do that final little piece. And uh, Kenny provided a great instrumental I got it and I was like, let me send it to him. I was like, I feel like this is the place. Pretty sure I was like, 
this is going to be the last song. So here's the context. You have first, and then I did the end. I love how it's the ending of the album, particularly because it just it feels so fitting, like especially hearing you describe all this, because I didn't know how in the moment a lot of these songs were. The fact that it really follows after waiting around like the Brussels situation, like it really follows a nice like chronological order as a listener. And it ends with you kind of just looking in the future and then not really knowing what's going to happen next. And then the album ends. I think I think it's just a I like how that the verse especially given how short it is and the way it kind of ends it's not expected at least on my first listen i didn't expect it to end where you ended it and the fact that you're articulating this fear of you know just wondering how much time you have to live and to enjoy this like and to be around your family all these kinds of ideas you you kind of touch on it just kind of is cool or, or like prescient or whatever the word is that you the the verse ends in that way because you you, there is no real resolution to resolving that. You just kind of have to live through that feeling forever until until you die, right? And I just think it's beautiful. It just gives me goosebumps every time. I swear it gives me goosebumps in the fucking gym. That's cool, man. That means a lot to me. I thought it was a really, I thought I thought it was, um, I thought it was strong. I thought it was strong. I was like, oh, that was when you just write it, and then you're like, I guess that's the end. I didn't plan it out like, oh, it's going to be like this or that. I did know that, but like I said, I let Lucy go first and just worked off of that. But yeah, I, 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 when I did it, I felt really good about it. Oh, it's funny, man. Uh, funny, funny story there, too. Shout out to Lewis Logic. You know who Lewis Logic? Yeah, I do. What's he got to do with this? Uh, Lewis Logic, that's my dude. So, me and him, we have a, a separate connection uh, having to do um, our sons go to the same like daycare or whatever. Mm. Um, but before that, one of the first times I realized me and Lewis Logic was in pretty close proximity. I was at the park with my daughter and um, she kind of got into some dispute with the kid. It ended up being Lewis Logic's son and his friend. As if. So they had some sort of whole thing happen where the parents have to be like, now you apologize to you. <laughs> you apologize. And I'm like, this is really funny. This is fucking Lewis Logic here. But yeah, that was the that was the nugget within that when I think about, you know, with kids or sometimes at the park and you see like your kid try to play with some kids and they're like no we don't want to play with you and you mm -hmm. feel really bad but that's like every that happened to everybody that's just part of being yeah. a little kid yeah you know? but it's weird to realize this is this person's first feeling or an early feelings of like rejection yeah it's surreal um or like seeing your kid like just shove somebody to the ground where <laughs> you're like, yo, you're wallet. Like you threw a person off the jungle gym. Like what the fuck is going on? Are you a serial killer? <laughs> it's like, no, that's also part of being a little kid as you might just shove somebody off a jungle gym because yeah. you feel annoyed they're in the way. Yeah. You don't know any better. And you have to be like, <laughs> you know, so yeah, shout out to Lewis Logic. Shout out to Lewis Logic, hundred percent. Okay, well before we, before we end this, I just want to give you an opportunity to shout out any kind of like upcoming projects, merch shows that you or the label have coming up. Oh man, um, well I'm going on tour with Kenny. Yep. Apparently, a lot of those shows are selling out. So of course, your booking guy starts to be like, "What if you just do twice as many shows?" <laughs> Oh, I'm good. Man. You might add one or two, but I think I'm good. The stuff, a lot of stuff I'm excited about at the label. Uh, Fat Boy Sharif and Still Tip Dove is around the corner. We have the vinyl wow. in house, so it'll ship when it gets here. Um, I honestly thought the high bias comp mixtape that we dropped earlier, I know a lot of it dropped in between Sketch 185 and Jeff Markey's incredible record. Mm hmm. Left nothing for the swim back. 
and obviously maps going off and you know different things happening but i really felt like uh high bias was a cool cool little record me and messiah music can make records all day all day like he said that beat it was just like bong it's easy he did read your bible right yeah it's easy it's a, that's crazy that's like a literally batshit crazy song yeah, i like that song a lot i'm like what the fuck we put this on the uh, go back in time and put this on the album or something so fat boy sharif and steel tip dub have an album coming up called decay it's gonna be incredible fat boy is just yeah he has a lot of vision that's what i say he's a star man works really hard and he has a vision to execute the things he wants to do he didn't even let me rap on his album but that's cool he's still a good guy uh i mean he didn't let anyone rap on his album we got a big record coming up with fielding nice that i think is unexpected and interesting weird little project a very limited amounts of vinyl but it's definitely going to be one something people are going to want to grab. Um, we've got a big record coming up with Cavalier. Yeah. Yeah, that's highly anticipated. Yeah, it's in fucking incredible. And I say that knowing that people's expectations should be high, given what Cavalier has done. I know Quelle's played a role in this project, and yeah, they're just the best. But I still think that people are gonna be surprised. I was, I was, I was surprised. Like at first, I was like, "Man, come to me earlier." Of course, we'll do it, but come to me earlier when I can like get out there and go just do some of the grunt work. Mm-hmm. Artists, you know, collect you some beats, talk to these and these people, get things moving, whatever features you need. But yo, the album is. So, yeah, again, lots of vision, lots of follow through, incredible record. Anyone who ever liked Cav is going to be one of those records that you can be like, well, this is why I kind of like how I feel like I told Bessie, you know what I mean? Like, mm. I like all the Lucid records, but if somebody was like, show me why this dude is nice, I'd be like, here. Yeah, that's the one. If you don't mess with this, then forget it. I don't know. Yeah. If you can mess with this, then you're going to have a lot of fun out on these other branches. You might even later on say one of these other ones is better. Who knows? But if you don't mess with I Told Bessie, I don't know what to tell you. Something's wrong. And it's a good summary of what he does. Like It kind of touches on a lot of his flavors and all vibes. Of all yeah. of it. If you can't understand that you're listening to like a generational talent, then forget it. Mm-hmm. The cab record that he came to us with it almost totally completed is a good demonstration of that, I think. And shout out to Pudge also, who I really hope that the label gets to work with more, man. Uh, I hooked him. Mm-hmm. Him and Cab hooked up on the High Bias compilation. Yeah, Meta that real quick real easy um and yeah Pudge is incredible um excited about that and then really late in the year we have a big big blockhead record yeah big record a lot of people were asking me oh are you you and tony doing another project and i was like yes and no it's definitely a blockhead project but it was nice to we worked together on doing some of this stuff and I'm definitely on there a bunch of times. So it was cool for that reason. Yeah, it's dope. And I and I mentioned you got the the book coming too, or you already dropped it. It's it's phenomenal. The the like the substance of the writing, but also just the the visuals from uh uh Great A is crazy. Great B is crazy. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. She's an incredibly talented person. All of, all of these people that I've been lucky enough to work with. And shout out um, to the directors if you uh, if you had an opportunity to see the soft landing video. Oh my god, amazing! That was that's one of your best videos. Like holy shit, Thank just you. so well done. Tim and Henry did a great job. 
Um, some of you who have been around know that Joseph and I who work together on a lot of visuals. Joseph has a movie that he's working on. So he was kind of caught up and um, I had the good fortune to work with these guys. And not only that, we have another, another one coming up. So at least one more video with them. Uh, good experiences. Yeah, that's it. I mean, we're going to have a save yourself repress with the instrumentals, oh. a double vinyl with the yes. instrumentals. Uh, that's my biggest one of my biggest backwards related regrets is that i didn't cop that when i like i saw it like someone on discogs had it at a reasonable price and i was just like i was just starting my record collection i'm like okay hey, let me just i was buying so much stuff at the same time and i'm like okay hey, i'll go back to that later and then fucking no chance i don't know what album of yours dropped like maybe it was like shrines dropped or haram dropped and that price was like in the 200s i'm like okay well fuck me but Yes, yeah, so double double vinyl, double vinyl with uh, instrumentals. That's amazing. And like That's such good news. More artwork. Um, yeah, I think it would be really cool. Willie Curly Castro. Now these are very limited amounts of Little Robert Hutton vinyl that we're getting in. I think there's only like 400 pieces, 500 made, 400 available. Um, amazing. Excited to see those um yeah and that's it obviously like i said before there'll be an arm and hammer record later this year excited about that that's it man excited to we got two shows upcoming in la that's gonna be fun yeah that's it really and that's a lot that's a lot there but uh can't wait a lot especially those vinyl represses and really everything yeah i just i just want to say it's been it's truly an amazing thing seeing the appreciation of your music and uh continue to grow in the success and acclaim for you and not only you just the the whole backwoods camp as well continue to grow i know listeners of the show know this already but you are legitimately my favorite artist ever i don't say that lightly or just to gas you up like your music has made my life infinitely better and it's helped me grow as a person you know weather life storm so i just appreciate you and thank you thank you so much for coming on the show this was a blast thank you i uh, look forward to seeing it Obviously, you've been very successful on your own. It's funny because one of the new offers that came in was Toronto. And I was like, oh, you know, Rohan would probably be around. I would probably be around. But Canadian Customs is one of the most annoying things. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the best. It it's not the best. Annoyance. But then also Toronto and good weather. Oh, was the show in summer? Like that, or at least at the yeah, proposed time? In the next couple months. It's a toss up right now. I got to actually make that call real soon. But um, okay, well, I'll talk to you soon. Let me know if you need anything at all. Yeah, for sure. And I'll see you in New York in about a month. Uh, okay. Enjoy the rest of the shows and peace out. Peace. So there we have it. Another episode of the Rap Music Plug podcast presented by QLC TV. I hope this episode gave you some new perspectives and insights into what the greatest art form known to man in hip-hop music has to offer. If you want to support the show in the most meaningful way possible, it would be my absolute honor to have you as a patron in the new Rap Music Plug podcast Patreon. Through this Patreon, you will be getting exclusive content such as bonus episodes, exclusive album recommendations, exclusive playlists, early access to episodes, and more. And above all, though, you will be able to support the show directly in a way that will not only justify the crazy amount of time I spend on this show already, but allow me to cover some of the expenses related to supporting all of these great artists that we cover on the show through the website and will allow us to sustain and build on this amazing growth that the RMPP has experienced recently. So if you have any questions about any of the Patreon stuff or just want to keep tabs on the show, interact with me on rap music and all the great stuff that we can talk about, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Rap Music Plug Pod or shoot me an email at qlctv.podcast at gmail.com. You can also rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe on YouTube and Spotify as well. But that's enough self-promotion for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Peace. Peace.